Hi everyone. Welcome back to English 247. This is for our class for Tuesday, the 4th of June, where I wanted to continue talking about Frankenstein and also remind you that last class I had distributed the topic for paper number one, which is also the topic for paper number two, but you are free to create your own topic just as long as you have the topic approved by me ahead of time. So I encourage you to begin thinking about ideas as we go through the text. And I'll talk a little bit more about the construction of the papers next class. But today I wanted to talk about Frankenstein. I had left you with watching the very iconic 1930s film about Frankenstein that really has formulated the popular culture conception of Frankenstein, which is a very different story than what Mary Shelley had offered us in her text. It's one of the reasons why I wanted you to see the film. And as you know, Frankenstein straddles a lot of different genres. We can talk about Frankenstein from the feminist perspective, but we can also talk about Frankenstein from the Gothic perspective. And from the Gothic perspective, probably those 1930s films from Universal Studios, films like Frankenstein and Dracula and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, really laid the foundation for horror film. As you know, I teach a class in horror film where we talk about that a little bit more in depth. But Frankenstein also has been viewed as one of the first science fiction films and certainly one of the first science fiction stories. And the distinction between Gothic and science fiction is small. And usually what we talk about when we talk about the idea of the Gothic are certain conventions that are associated with the Gothic tradition, which started in the 1700s in England. Things like haunted castles and possible supernatural events and a damsel in distress and secret passageways and mysteries that need to be solved. Very much focusing on the idea of environment. So you can think about the importance of atmosphere for um, times like Halloween. And that first Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto, is credited with creating many of these conventions. Not a particularly well-written novel, but it led to perhaps the more well-known stories in the Gothic tradition of, again, Frankenstein and Dracula and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And in terms of thinking about Frankenstein, it's usually not considered to be a feminist text. And in fact, many people don't even realize that a female author wrote this story, Mary Shelley. And I had talked a little bit last class about how she received some editorial feedback and suggestions from her husband, Percy Shelley, the great romantic poet, which has led to some controversy as to whether or not we can fully attribute the text to her which I think in and of itself shows a certain level of sexism because it's not at all uncommon for authors to receive editorial commentary and feedback and for authors to incorporate that into their text. My suspicion has always been that if Mary Shelley wasn't a female, um, then these questions wouldn't have even been raised. But before I get into the text itself, I wanted to talk about the Hollywood film version that you saw which has really laid the foundation for what most people think of with Frankenstein. And I would encourage you to pay careful attention to the opening credits where the film is introduced as being based on a novel by Mer Mrs. Percy Shelley. And I think this says everything about not only the time period that Mary Shelley wrote this novel, but also the time period of the 1930s when this film was made. And we talked a little bit about this with the story of an hour the idea of Mrs. Mallard being seen as a piece of property to Brentley, not really being given a first name. The idea that she's seen as Mrs. Percy Shelley, Percy Shelley being her husband, the great romantic poet, I think says everything about the lack of a trip, uh, attribution and also the lack of agency oftentimes afforded to female. And other changes I'm sure you noticed as you were watching the film is the name switch between Victor and Henry, which is confusing certainly to audience members if they are also reading the text. I suspect it has something to do with the time period 
And if you think about Victor being a more German sounding name and perhaps that not being appropriate for a male lead, instead the film offers us Henry as the male lead. But of course, we know that Mary Shelley gave us a very different um, perspective by giving us a Victor Frankenstein as the lead and Henry Clerval as the friend. And again, I wanted to mostly focus on the text because this is an English class rather than a film class. But of course, Frankenstein is so closely aligned with film. I thought it was important to at least expose you to the film and also offer you a little bit more time to get through the text itself. Probably the biggest surprise in watching the film Frankenstein is the conception that the creature, and I use this word very deliberately, is the monster. And that's because of how the creature was presented in the film. That's not at all Mary Shelley's story. The true monstrosity is humanity. And we see this through Victor Frankenstein, first through his creation of something that's unnatural creating life from death, and secondly, and perhaps more importantly, negating his responsibility to the creation of life. So we can see a lot of modern day parallels there about absentee parents and the role that um, neglectful parents play in the raising and rearing of their children and how much responsibility should their children be um, uh, how much responsibility should their children embrace considering the fact that they didn't necessarily have guidance in their youth? And of, of course, it's a great philosophical question to which we have no clear cut answer. Eventually, we need to take responsibility for our actions despite our upbringing. But certainly we see in the novel Frankenstein, and I, I'm hopeful that at this point you've actually read the novel in its entirety and are actually beginning our next novel, Persuasion. That's really the best way to work through the class. Um, but if you haven't gotten through the novel, I don't think that um, I'm telling you anything that's too surprising, that Victor Frankenstein is the creator of this creature through unnatural means. And then we see how ultimately Victor Frankenstein negates his responsibility to rear this creature because of its appearance. So lots of elements of this text can be related to what I call the isms in society, racism and classism and sexism. We tend to reject that which is considered other or alien. And we see how Victor Frankenstein does that in the novel and also in the film. So even though in Hollywood, the conception is that uh, the creature is the monster, Boris Karloff, who plays the creature, it gives us a very um, empathetic portrayal of this creature. We see how he's tortured by Fritz. There's never a Fritz in the novel. That's very much a, a gothic or a horror film convention. Um, and how ultimately the creature is misunderstood. Even in the film version, we see how the creature tries to uh, basically befriend a young girl. They're throwing petals into the water. The creature misunderstanding that while you can throw flower petals in the water, you can't necessarily throw people into the water. So the young girl drowns. The story that Mary Shelley gives us is slightly different in that a young girl is drowning and even after the creature has experienced multiple rejections, the creature tries to save this drowning girl and of course is rewarded with violence and, and ostracization. So I think that while the film is different than the novel, it tries to keep some of the integrity of the sympathy towards the creature. What perhaps also is misunderstood is that the name of the novel Frankenstein is not the name of the creature. It's the name of the creator. The creature's never named. That's one of the first ways that the parent in this, in this text um, negates his responsibility in that one of the first roles that a parent has is to name their offspring or their creation and that's something that Victor never does so this creature continues as I uh, nameless and, and, and basically without agency or without voice and so it learns from humanity now as much as I enjoy the text Frankenstein um, Mary Shelley was only a teenager when she wrote it she was in her late teens and there are certainly places for improvement one of the places that I always have to suspend perhaps too much disbelief is the fact that after the creature is created, he's able to um, 
teach itself basically how to read and write. Um, and it happens to find a satchel of books in the forest. And I oftentimes joke about that, that how nice that would be as college students if we could find a satchel of our assigned texts in the wilderness. And um, the texts it finds are rather complex texts, um, such as Milton's Paradise Lost, which is how the novel begins as well. So I wanted to draw your attention to the very first page of the novel. The novel title is shortened. It's, it's usually people refer to it as Frankenstein, but it, the title in its entirety is Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. And you can see in the notes below, I'm included how Prometheus is from Greek mythology. He was punished for stealing fire from the gods and giving it to humanity. And this gives us a little bit of foreshadowing about the story of Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, that is, who will be punished for basically stealing the knowledge of the gods, um, in this instance, how to create life. Um, and one of the things that we see from the very beginning of the novel through Mary Shelley's use of uh, Greek mythology and also some quotations from some very famous texts, including Paradise Lost, is that she's very well read and this is very much a story that's embedded in literary tradition. So we get references to Milton's Paradise Lost and creation. And if you haven't read Milton's Paradise Lost, you're at a bit of a disadvantage here, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's a great epic poem from the 1700s. And basically it's supposed to be about the story of the fall of man, the biblical story about how um, Eve and Adam are tempted by Satan in the Garden of Eden. The way that this text is subversive and, and revolutionary in many respects is that it offers us the perspective of Satan, uh, Lucifer, which comes off as a rather sympathetic character. And notice that Mary Shelley makes that um, reference right at the very beginning on the opening page. Um, why was I created if I was going to be abandoned? And we will see these references throughout the text. In fact, the creature is going to find Milton's Paradise Lost and compare itself both to Adam, not having a mate, and also to Lucifer, who was created and then abandoned by his creator. There are also references to um, Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. I actually happened to do my graduate work in Christopher Marlowe. And Christopher Marlowe was a contemporary of Shakespeare's and one of his, well, actually his most famous play um, is Dr. Faustus, which is based on a German story in which you have a, a doctor by the name of Faustus who sells his soul to the devil for infinite knowledge. And basically, um, Faustus ends up squandering that knowledge and eventually is taken into hell. Um, and by the time that Faustus is ready to repent, because he spends the majority of the play coming up with excuses as to why he shouldn't repent. Either he's so evil he could never be forgiven by God, or the fact that he still has time so that he can continue to engage in a sinful behavior and then ultimately repent. Um, by the time Faustus is being dragged into hell, kicking and screaming, he repents. It's a little bit um, too little too late, so to speak. So there's a moral or a lesson. And you'll oftentimes find that in Gothic texts as well, that there's a moral or a lesson. In fact, you'll find that generally speaking in literature as well, that there's a moral or there's a lesson. Um, even something with something like the story of an hour where many of you indicated that you were frustrated or disappointed in the ending because it basically deprives Mrs. Mallard of an opportunity for freedom. I think we as readers are supposed to feel that way. We're supposed to want to rebel against the system that basically disenfranchises female. And might I argue that authors such as Chopin were successful in motivating their readers to um, take active steps of rebellion. So I think art oftentimes is responsible for political change. Um, so that said, I wanted you to know just a little bit about the literary references right on the opening page. And also was very surprising to readers is the format of this novel, especially if you've seen this, the film Frankenstein, which has obviously been simplified and it also has been abridged in order to fit into the Hollywood standards of time. But Mary Shelley gives us what's known as an epistolary novel. You can see that in the notes below. And it's a novel that's told through letters. 
This is a very common convention of the time period to tell a novel through letters, which in some ways leads to a certain sense of authenticity because you've got physical records. But in other ways, it leads to problems with reliability of narrator. And this is perhaps one of the most important things to keep in mind when you are reading Frankenstein, is that these are all a series of letters that are written by Robert Walton. Again, we're never given a Robert Walton in the film. To his sister, Mrs. Seville, and that means we never get a direct account from Victor Frankenstein. We never get a direct account from the creature. Um, so this leads to problems with our um, trusting of the narrator because Walton is in a poor condition. As we see at the very beginning of the novel, he basically is trying to unearth secrets that have not been unearthed prior to this time. He's trying to find um, geographic passages as he's working his way through the Arctic. Notice how similar he is in some ways to Victor, trying to find knowledge which is unknown and perhaps forbidden to mankind. Walton is on a ship where he feels isolated and alienated. And I can tell you that in the world of the Gothic, isolation is usually a very bad thing. Walton talks about how he's all alone and he's writing sis letters to his sister about his experiences. And he says that he happens to come across a traveler um, who's drifting on a raft and that traveler happens to be Victor Frankenstein and this happens to be Victor Frankenstein's story, which is told to us in the first person, I, in the way that Victor would have told his story to Walton. But keep in mind, we never hear from Victor. This is Walton relating what was told to him from Victor. And this is after the fact. At the ending of the day, Walton is trying to reconstruct what Victor has said. So think about all of the possibilities for misinformation from the way that Walton is presenting this tale to his sister. First of all, Walton is hungry. He's thirsty. He fears mutiny from his crew. He's tired. He's in bad physical shape. He's also in bad emotional shape as he talks about his loneliness and isolation and feels that he doesn't have connection with anyone on the ship. And then, assuming that those two elements aren't in play, he's trying to reconstruct this story verbatim hours after it's been told to him. So there can definitely be elements of the text that are incorrect, which has led to the question of how much of this text is indeed fantasy. Could all of this be a figment of Walton's imagination, some sort of a subconscious projection, which is a possibility. Um, usually the text is read though as a straightforward account from Walton about a character named Victor. And the thing is, is that we've got narrative embedded within narrative embedded within narrative, because when we get Victor's account, he's giving us the creature's perspective, for instance. We never get a direct reference from the creature. So all of this could be a personification or, or a, a, a projection, I should say, of Victor, who also feels isolated and also feels alienated. Um, and yes, at the very ending of the novel, and I hope I'm not giving away spoilers, supposedly Walton and the creature actually interact with one another. But again, this could be a figment of Walton's imagination. So. This leads to a layer of complexity to the storytelling that we wouldn't necessarily expect from such a young author. And the reliability of narrator is only one of the elements that makes this piece so interesting. Um, the parallels, as I had suggested, between Wal Walton and Victor, and Victor and Walton, um, they both are filled with ambition. They both are filled with hubris, which is excessive ambition. They both are isolated, they both are lonely, and they both are facing uh, negative consequences for their ambition. Um, the way that this text could be read as a feminist text in terms of our lens is that we have central male characters and notice the absence of female. And this could very easily be Mary Shelley's commentary about what happens when female is excluded that men basically um, engage in ambition and hubris, and there isn't anything to temper that. 
and the few times that Victor is able to be with Elizabeth or with his family, he seems much more grounded um, than when he's on his own. The same with Walton. Notice that he reaches out to a female figure, his sister in this instance, and it's only when he isolates himself from the female that we see the consequences of this. Another way of thinking about this novel from the feminist perspective is that our central character is indeed female. If you've read enough, you've seen that there are these long passages that talk about nature and the natural world and the nurturing elements associated with nature. In fact, when Victor embraces nature, that's usually when, again, he's more grounded. When he isolates himself from nature, that's usually when problems occur. And nature is usually presented in the feminine, uh, mother nature. Keep this in mind when we read Jane Eyre, for instance, where there's direct reference to the idea of nature being the universal mother. So this rejection of nature in the natural world and the natural order could be seen as very much a rejection of the feminine. When we read further along, there are some perhaps surprising female characters. Most of the female characters are very similar to what we would expect after reading The Cult of True Womanhood, that they show piety and domesticity and submissiveness. But there is a character by the name of Safi later on in the text. Again, we aren't given this character in the film versions of Frankenstein, nor are we given the De Lacy family subplot that we would be given in the novel. Again, one of the many reasons why it's important to read the text in addition to watching a film adaptation because that's all film is, is an adaptation. But Safi very much is an independent woman in the sense that she defies many of the expectations of her time. And if you've gotten to that point in the novel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'll reference this a little bit today and more so next class. So you might have noticed that and you will certainly notice as the semester progresses, we oftentimes are given um, motherless children and motherless daughters. This begins already with the beginning of uh, Elizabeth's story that we're told that she's adopted into the family. And um, while she's considered Victor's cousin, they don't have any blood connection. It's one of the reasons why they can marry. Um, that said, it wouldn't have been unusual during this time period for blood cousins to marry, especially if they wanted to retain a certain level of birthright. This is something that we will see when we read Persuasion, the importance of marrying um, within or above one's class, particularly in the higher classes, which oftentimes led to unions of cousins and distant relations. But one of the reasons why Elizabeth is chosen to be adopted by the family is because she has European features. So as progressive as Mary Shelley might be about giving us a, a creature whose hideous appearance is the reason why it's rejected as other, we often see a Eurocentrism in Shelley's writing as well, as well as um, an emphasis on Christianity and uh, negation of anything that is not Christian. So these authors are definitely products of their time. Victor loses his mother early on. That could be the impetus for Victor trying to create life from death or everlasting life. Um, Mary Shelley herself had lost her mother at a young age, had a very difficult relationship with her stepmother. So I think we can see some autobiographical references that are included in the text itself. There are also occult references in this text that I um, draw attention to my Gothic literature students to try to discuss why this text belongs into the realm of Gothic literature, which usually embraces the supernatural, as opposed to science fiction, where science can explain the events, it's just our science is not advanced enough. But if you know anything about the Philosopher's Stone, um, and this is referenced early on in Frankenstein, and perhaps you know the Philosopher's Stone from the Harry Potter series. So fantasy is also in a firmly um, a, a, another genre that, that can cross over into the occult or into sci-fi. The ph Philosopher's Stone is supposed to be an occult reference to allow um, um, everlasting life or to create life from death. Um, there's also reference to Cornelius Agrippa, who happens to be a great occultist, if you know your occult history. So that's how I 
sort of talk about Frankenstein with its gothic elements. And of course, that great creation scene, which does not come at the beginning of the novel the way most readers expect. In fact, that creation scene is something that Mary Shelley had dreamt up. I believe I told the origin story for this novel that Mary Shelley was vacationing with um, her friends and husband and because of inclement weather, they challenged themselves and each other to a ghost story writing competition. And this was the dream Mary Shelley had of that night about the creation of the creature. And of course, that led to the story that she created around that creation story. But I wanted to draw your attention to part two of the notes below, where I've given a little bit of an overview of some things to consider. I'll talk about some quotes in greater depth next class. But those letters to Mrs. Seville, Walton's sister, Margaret, again, notice her reference to it as a Mrs. Uh, Seville, that again, she's not given individual identity necessarily. And in letter, Walt, in letter one, Walton says that he prefers glory to every enticement that wealth is placed in his path. So this lays the foundation for his arrogance and his hubris, and again, parallels with Victor himself. And in letter two, Walton admits that he has no friend, Margaret, that he's going to unvisited regions that he's about to explore. And we could say the same with Victor as well, whether these are literal unvisited geographic regions or whether these are regions of knowledge, almost like Dr. Faustus, who wanted um, the knowledge of the gods and is punished accordingly. And in letter three, Walton talks about what can stop a determined heart and resolved will of man. Again, this is a uh, morality tale that sometimes the determined heart and the resolved will um, basically is unnatural and usurps the power of God. And Walton talks about how he first encounters Wick Victor, saying he was not as the other travelers seemed to be a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered island, but a European. Again, we get that Eurocentrism there. And then in letter four, Walton and, and Victor talks about how um, um, Victor had sought for the dominion that he should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. Again, we're speaking in the first person in the eye of Victor talking, so it sounds like Victor is a character, but again, this is all um, hearsay based on what Walton has heard from Victor, supposedly. And he tells Walton, unhappy man, do you share my madness? The idea is that Victor is going to be telling this as a cautionary tale so that Walton does not make the same mistakes that Victor did. And in letter four, Walton, talking about Victor, talks about how Victor is a slave of passion. And this is something that we'll see throughout the text about being um, a slave of or a master of passion. This is something that the creature is going to experience as well. And it's only after those series of, no, uh, of letters, I should say, that we begin the novel with Victor's story in chapter one. But keep in mind always that Victor's story is embedded within the letter writing that Walton is writing to his sister. And in chapter one, Wilton, uh, Victor says how he was his parents' plaything and their idol, something better, their child. And there's some irony here and also some foreshadowing. The irony is how well Victor's parents treated him and Victor does not do the same with his own creation, the creature. And the second is that Victor says that his parents thought of Victor as a plaything and an idol, not necessarily as an individual. And certainly that's something that Victor is guilty of with his own creation. And then also in chapter one, Victor tells us about the introduction of Elizabeth, whom he's eventually engaged to, um, adopted into the family. The child was thin and fair, and till death she was to be mine only. So this is Victor's, quote, sister, unquote. He thinks of her as cousin, also his fiance. And I think it's very indicative of what we saw with the cult of true womanhood, of female being possession of male. And then in chapter two, Victor says, the world was to me a secret that I desired to divine. It was the secrets of heaven and earth that I desired. Again, very Faustian, and there will be negative consequences because of this. And chapter four, and this is something that Victor says over and over again, that it was as if he had been guilty of a crime. This is one of the reasons why he's shunning his fellow creatures. Well, Victor is guilty of a crime, multiple crimes. First, about usurping the natural order by creating life from death. And secondly, by negating his responsibility to the life that he creates. 
it's only in chapter five that we get that very famous creation scene, that dreary night in November, which is very gothic with the rain falling and the darkness and the lightning. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that next class as well. Now, as I had indicated, there's some places where the writing might be uh, a little bit um, uneven. And in chapter six, I think there's reference to this when Elizabeth says to Victor, um, you might remember Justine, she was a great favorite of yours. Now, obviously, if Justine was a great favorite of Victor's, he wouldn't need to be reminded of her. This was um, the author's way, Mary Shelley's way of introducing this character of Justine, which of course sounds like justice. Um, and then in um, chapter nine, we're introduced to the creature who's very different than what Hollywood has given us, this sort of uh, grunting, inarticulate being. Instead, we see a creature who's very articulate. And uh, if you are familiar with the philosophical debate of nature versus nurture and what ultimately influences us more, is it a birthright or is an environment or some combination thereof, we could say that the creature begins almost as a tabla rasa, Again, if you're familiar with philosophy, a blank slate. And the initial responses the creature has is to appreciate nature, which is viewed as a positive, and to engage in benevolent activities. Notice he tries to assist the De Lacy family. Teaches itself language, which shows a certain level of motivation, ambition, and intelligence. It uses reason. Again, it teaches itself how to read. Again, we might have to suspend some disbelief here and to read, of all things, Paradise Lost, a very complex text, and compares itself to both the creatures of Adam and Satan in Paradise Lost, both the creations of God, and in some ways um, neglected by God. And then in chapter 11, we finally get the creature story. And keep in mind that we never hear directly from the creature. This is Victor relating the creature story. And again, further removed, this is Walton relating Victor's, relating the creature's story. And what we find out is that the creature, after it's abandoned by Victor, it goes and it finds itself in the wilderness and eventually comes across, across the DeLacy family happens to have, be led by a blind old man and an exiled family. And we get this convoluted tale about why the family has been exiled because of some perceived injustices that it tried to prevent. And it was portrayed, it was betrayed. Um, and the blind old man is perfect for the element of the idea of the other, that which seems alien, and that the blind old man can't see the creature's appearance so this is the greatest possibility the creature has of befriending somebody if he can approach the blind old man on his own and the creature as it's reading at, from its satchel of books as he finds so conveniently in the wilderness wonders because he's got historical accounts of mankind as well was man indeed at once so powerful so virtuous and magnificent as it says in chapter 13 as well as so vicious and base and the answer is yes. Um, and this is where we learn the story of how the De Lacy family has been exiled. And this happens to be another narrative about a character named Safi. And her mother was a Christian Arab who, and again, notice the emphasis on Christianity, taught Safi to, quote, aspire to the higher powers of intellect and independence of spirit forbidden to the female fo followers of Muhammad, unquote. And certainly Christianity afforded more power to female, but as we saw in the cult of true womanhood, that was also very much um, in, in, negated by the stereotypes and the perceptions of the time period. In chapter 14, we find the story that Sethi's father loathed the idea that his daughter should be united to a Christian, where we get this long convoluted tale that Felix de Lacy, the son of the family, intervened when Safi's father was accused of um, a crime he did not commit. And Safi's father said that if, if Felix could intervene and release him from prison, then Felix would be rewarded with his beautiful daughter. Again, notice how female is given as a kind of prize. Of course, Safi's father never meant to um, um, never meant to fulfill that promise he was going to renege on it because he loathes the idea that his daughter should be united to a Christian, which is what Felix says. So, 
and the creature says that he learned about his creation because we have to wonder how would the creature know about his creation through the pocket of the dress that he had taken from um, his creator's laboratory when he ran off. Um, and again, that could explain how the creature has knowledge of his creation so that he can come back and attempt to um, achieve justice from his creator. Um, it also shows the importance of letters and letter writing in terms of being able to forward a narrative. And as much as things change, they remain the same because think about how important social media is um, and, and texting in terms of communicating. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the creature talks about how in chapter 16, only Victor has um, the ability to pity the creature and to redress the wrongs that were done to the creature. And Victor says in chapter 19, I felt as if I had committed some great crime. I was guiltless, but I had indeed drawn down a horrible curse upon myself. Again, Victor had created some great crime. What we um, find out is that Safi um, ends up showing uh, a certain level of um, independence um, by um, running away and following her heart, which is to find Felix and his exiled fa um, family after they've been portrayed, uh, betrayed by her father. Um, again, she does not know the language. She does not have much in the way of finances, which shows a rather a daring and strong female at this point. And it also creates the narrative that the DeLacy family needs to teach Safi English and the creature is able to overhear all of this and consequently teach itself English. And of course the creature tries to approach the de blind DeLacy um, figurehead but the family returns and sees the creature, rejects the creature and the creature in anger runs off and shows retribution on the family. And at that point, the creature sees a drowning girl and thinks that he can intervene, even though he's been rejected so horribly by his own creator and also the DeLacy family and the way that the creature is, um, quote, rewarded, unquote, for its benevolence is that he's attacked and shot at. And this is where the creature decides that he's going to find his creator and demand uh, retribution. And the creature just so happens to come across in its travels, Victor's younger brother, William. And William rejects the creature as well. And the creature kills William. Again, there is no justification for murder, but certainly we can see how the creature could be um, viewed from a, a sympathetic eye and that he's been rejected by his creator and by all of humanity up until this point and led to fend on its own. And then it turns out that Justine, remember her, who was a favorite of the uh, family, who also was um, orphaned and also was taken into the family. So we see that motif of motherless child again. It turns out that Justine is out searching for William and um, the creature is able to take when Justine is sleeping in exhaustion, um, a miniature that Justine was wearing and basically um, pin it onto um, William so that basically he is um, uh, making it appear that Justine herself is responsible for William's murder. So again, the creature has learned mischief. Um, he's learned how to frame individuals um, because he's witnessed all of the sins of humanity and he's read about the sins of humanity. Um, and then the creature talks about how he's made it his mission to demand a victor mate. And he, he has some very reasonable arguments. Again, the creature does have the ability to um, engage in critical thinking and, and, and formulate arguments that um, uh, the creature is alone. And if only the creature had at least had a mate that he could share his life with, then uh, the creature could uh, stop his um, retribution against humanity. And Victor says that he is going to do that. And then in the end, Victor negates and decides that he doesn't want to do that. He rationalizes it by saying that perhaps the creature will mate and have uh, children. Though again, one suspects that if, creature, if Victor can create life from death, he can probably create a uh, 
infertile creature so that they don't mate. And Victor also talks about how he's afraid that they'll become this master race, the two of them, and um, enact retribution against humanity together. But because Victor has um, made a promise and is negated on that promise, the creature has decided that he will seek vengeance. Um, and says to Victor in chapter 20, I will be with you on your wedding night. By this point, Victor is ready to abandon his um, pursuit of the dark arts and focus on family. And of course, Victor in his arrogance and hubris assumes that I will be with you on your wedding night is a threat against him, Victor, but it's really against Elizabeth whom he's going to marry. Um, the best way to um, hurt somebody is to hurt the person they love. And not only does a creature murder Elizabeth, the creature also murders Clerval. And Clerval is Victor's best friend, and you probably notice they have a very intimate relationship. Some have even argued that there are perhaps homoerotic elements within that relationship, and one of the reasons why Victor was so hesitant to marry Elizabeth. But regardless, the creature knows how ultimately the best way to hurt Victor is to hurt the people he loves, so that Victor becomes much like the creature, as isolated and alienated and alone as the creature is. And it's only after all of this that we return back in chapter 24 to Walton to remind us that all of this is Walton's narrative, telling his sister, Mrs. Seville, about what he's encountered. And Victor says in chapter 24, and this is to Walton's mutinous crew, because at this point they've run low on supplies and they think they're on a fool's errand, to, quote, be men or more than men, be steady for your purpose and firm as a rock. So Victor is telling the crew to continue on, even though it's a, fur, uh, a fool's errand, even though at the beginning of the narrative, Victor was saying that he didn't want Walton to follow in Victor's footsteps and create and make the same errors that Victor himself made with excessive arrogance and ambition and pride. So we can see how Victor vacillates throughout this text, um, not just by saying as if I, as if I myself were guilty, he is indeed guilty. But at one point, he says that he wants to tell Walton this tale so that Walton does not engage in the same errors. But yet, at the very ending of the tale, Walton um, and, and Walton's crew are being urged by Victor to continue on, despite the uselessness of their journey. At this point, in theory, the creature who has been pursuing Vil um, um, Victor, it's been a cat and mouse game, um, after uh, Victor's um, uh, family and friends have been killed, um, that um, they basically live to pursue one another. Um, the creature ultimately comes a little bit too late. By this point, um, Victor has, has fallen into disease and has passed. And the creature says that now that, that um, Victor is no longer alive, there really isn't any reason for the creature to be alive. Supposedly, the creature is talking to Walton at this particular point. But keep in mind that again, we never hear from the creature. This is just Walton's narrative. Impotent envy, and this is in chapter 24, and bitter indignation filled me with an insatiable thirst for vengeance. I was the slave, not the master. Notice I told you how servitude and mastery is a major theme here. I'm an impulse which I detested, yet could not disobey. And then the very ending, which is so different from the film Frankenstein. I shall collect my funeral pile and consume to ashes this miserable frame. The, associate, uh, the assumption that the, vic, um, that the creature is going to commit suicide because it no longer has a reason to live. And at this point, Walton makes the decision to turn back. So if there's any kind of happy ending here is that Walton has perhaps learned about the dangers associated with being a modern Prometheus. Um, taking the knowledge that should not be given to humanity. Um, so that gives you an idea of the novel as a whole. Next class, I wanted to talk about some specific quotations of the novel. I also wanted to talk about some conventions associated with writing papers, because I'm hopeful that you're thinking about the first paper at this point. And as you know, I'm talking about the papers in the context of the quote that I selected from The Cult of True Womanhood, but you aren't necessarily required to do that. You could select a different quote from The Cult of True Womanhood or a different topic altogether. Just make sure that you have that topic approved by me. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about paper number one. And paper number two is going to be very similar to paper number one. The distinction being that paper number one is going to talk about one of the earlier set of texts in the semester. And paper number two will talk about one of the later set of texts in the semester. And as I indicated, I'm hopeful that you've finished Frankenstein at this point, but if you haven't, this is certainly the time to do so. Certainly before I start to get into some of the quotation that I will discuss next class. And you'll see that in the notes below in the third section, I have given you a link to Persuasion. I ordered Persuasion as a text for the class, but I've also found it online. Whenever I can find free online links, I share that with you. So I'm hopeful that you can begin Persuasion. Um, for those of you who have either started or are going to start Persuasion, this is a very slow text. Um, and deliberately so, because what we get is the story of the landed gentry and nobility. So this is of uh, the very wealthy. Now, uh, now we'll, um, Frankenstein and, and characters such as Victor Frankenstein are very comfortable. Um, but we will take that up um, a bit more when we read uh, Persuasion. We'll see the importance of marriage in this um, social class and of making the right match. Um, and as I indicated, it moves very slowly because we're supposed to get a lens into what the life of the, of the privileged and the wealthy would be. And it's a very empty life in many respects where there are a lot of unaccounted hours in the day that are filled with things like social functions and gossip. This will be in contrast to Jane Eyre, which will be the text after that, which is very different and filled with action. Um, I know I personally find Persuasion to be a, a slow and sometimes a boring read, but I, I think that was the intent of the author to give us these long classical sentences to indicate the kind of lifestyle that these individuals would be living. I always see it as a message to me now that the summer session has begun in earnest to sort of slow down. Um, so I hope that perhaps you can see the same as well. But certainly, even though Jane Eyre is a much longer book, it will move much more quickly. But I, I just wanted to give you a warning ahead of time about persuasion, about what you're likely to find. So what's left is basically our discussion forum question, and that will be due on Thursday the 6th. And certainly if you need additional time, please let me know and I'll be happy to grant it to you. Did you like or dislike uh, Mary Shelley's use of the epistolary novel technique in Frankenstein and why? And obviously there's no right or wrong answer to this. I've been asking you uh, multiple questions that are based on opinion and preference because I'm really more interested in your reasoning than I am in the ultimate answer. And as you know, you're not required to respond to your classmates um, um, posts, but you are required to read your classmates posts and my responses in turn, because I respond to all of you as well. That'll give you a good idea of what we would have talked about in class. Um, if you do decide to respond to your classmates, it would be very similar to what would happen in a face-to-face -face class if someone says something in class and you felt the desire to respond. So you're not required to, but you are required to read everything, um, much like you would be required to listen to everything if you were in a face-to-face -face class. So I see this first part of our video, the content that I would have discussed in a face-to-face -face class, and then your discussion form responses that you will read and my responses to those as the class discussion element of, um, of the course. So I hope you're all doing well. I'm doing well. We will put some closure onto Frankenstein next class, talk a little bit about paper number one and begin persuasion. Take care, bye-bye.